All right, so I'll give you a high-level overview of Pi Square and how it connects with the key framework and everything we do, right? And uh, and uh, I'll be open for some discussions. Right, so that's it. Right, so that's all I want to talk about today. Um, Pi Square comes from proof of proof, right? So we have zk proofs or zero knowledge proofs of mathematical proofs. The K framework is parametric in programming languages. That's what it was from the very beginning, from 2001, when we had the very first rough version, 2003, an implementation, and then ever since that was the philosophy underlying K. Programming languages are just inputs, data into the framework. Plug and play your language. Right, be that language EVM or Python or Java or C and so on and so forth. There are more than 30 languages so far from an IDK. You plug your language and now K is instantiated with your language and understands and knows how to handle computational tasks in your language. Now, what are computational tasks? I also call them claims here. So a claim, mathematically speaking, is a theorem. Um, a programming language in K, mathematically speaking, is a mathematical theory, a set of axioms that define that language. Now, claims, theorems, include conventional computational uh, tasks, like executions of program. To execute a program, take factorial of three in Java. Factorial of three equals six, you execute the program factorial of three, get the result six, now factorial of three equals six is a mathematical theorem. In the mathematical theory, gamma, java. Okay, and when we execute the program with a tool, an interpreter, whatever it is, um, we should be able to generate a mathematical proof of that theorem. So in other words, if I log the detection of the interpreter of the JVM on the factorial of three equals six claim. When it finishes, it should generate me enough detail that I can now construct a mathematical proof to the last mathematical detail. The factorial of three equals indeed six in this mathematical theory of the Java language. Right? That's just for execution. And the same happens with all programming languages, no matter what it is. No matter how complicated the language it is, not, 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 doesn't matter what paradigm it has underneath, object oriented function, doesn't matter. The same applies to all languages, right? So languages are mathematical theories. Now, when I execute a program in that language, I extract a mathematical proof of the claim that I make there. But this claim can also be uh, more complex than just execution, like right? symbolic claims, like you saw in uh, the just presentation. Like they can have parameters. Um, they can be literally arbitrary properties about that programming language. Right? In the context of, um, of uh, the blockchain, we proved lots of properties. When we do security audit, we prove properties like this. A certain token uh, implementation is um, a correct implementation of a certain template of TRC20. Right. So ERC20 is a bunch of properties. And then when we take the code and prove that it has all those properties, in fact, it's a theorem. Also in the same gamma uh, of the programming language, like when we do executions, right? all of these get unified. All computational claims now become uniform theorems. And everything that K tools do in the end can be reduced mentally at least, to searching for a mathematical proof for the claim. Okay, so under the hood, theoretically at least, K constructs mathematical proofs for everything it does. We can share public. What was it? In general, your idea applies to any, any, group, any group, right? It is not just like yes. Yes. yes, So yes, you yes. can, in that flow, you can start as a mathematical proof. You have to write, but you need to have a very rigorous yes. uh, representation of proofs. Yes. Okay. You can start, you can use K 
together or you can you can replace together. you can replace k with chat gpt for so the chat gpt is smart enough to no. find proofs for us okay? okay one day it will be then we'll get the mathematical proof or you can simply do the proof by hand yes. or hire a guy in zimbabwe <laughs> Or a school there. Hey guys, why don't you prove this program for them? Right? And they prove it by hand. Doesn't matter. Eventually, we get a proof. Very really like, we do tasks, but you can do anything. The programming language is just a theory, and uh, the, this in this world here, there are only mathematical theories and proofs and theorems and proofs for them, right? So now we are talking about three parts of the form: mathematical theory gamma, plain pi, and actual proof pi. That use big pi versus small pi big pi for mathematical proofs because they are big <laughs> and small pi for cryptographic proofs because they are succinct okay so right and if you want to instantiate this paradigm so the pi squared paradigm is more general even than matching logic but if you want to instantiate it you need to pick a logic here you don't need to pick a framework okay you can use coke or link right to generate the match logic proofs Eventually, you need to get a proof in the mathematical logic of choice. And our mathematical logic of choice here is matching logic. Why? Because this was not an ad hoc logic that we came up with overnight. It was a consistent search for this logic over many, many years. And the objective, the goal, the success metric for such a logic was succinctness. We wanted the small logic that is powerful and expressive enough to capture any programming language as a mathematical theory and anything that you want to do as a theorem. Right? So exactly what we want to hear, that was what we searched for in 2000 or so, <laughs> since forever. Um, right. OK. But up to here, what we've got is a triple mathematical theory gamma a plain pi, which can be a particular representation of a program, um, equals six. Okay? And the mathematical proof that rigorously proves pi from gamma. Do you find that yeah, color? It's, uh, <laughs> pi, 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 which is the proof of gamma satisfied pi. That's what we this is argument number one, argument number two, and argument number three, the links. These two, if you want to think in terms of you know, blockchain, these two are public. This is the programming language. This is the claim I make, the transaction, whatever. And this is the actual proof why this is correct, according to like, the logic. We are here. This one? So it, it can be public, and we want it to be public, but it's huge. And, oh, uh, question, right? and transmitting it over the web can be a big problem, right? So this can be terabyte. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. massively compress that. I want to compress this with hash. Imagine this. I take the hash of it somehow, magically, and that's it. But some can use it to hide information. Yes, but we have better ways to hide information. So why would we want to hide information? Why? For example, you want to hide your age. When you go to a bar, you want a beer, they ask you to prove that you are 21 in the United States. In Romania. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and uh, you know you want to prove them that you are 21, but you don't want to tell them your age. Then you can prove this is the this is the native, what you can do. This pipe, right? If I'm thinking of the form, the resistant age, right? Such that um, the Nita <laughs> is that age A and A larger than 21. <laughs> so this this is now the theorem that you prove. You see, it's a very elegant way to hide information to abstraction that you already have in mathematics. What they do in the world of ZK is they generate circuit for this thing where this becomes you know the zero knowledge part. Maybe it's going to hide the identity as well. Maybe it's going to hide the identity. So I'm like, yeah. according to the, yeah, I, I have an ID. I have an ID according to I don't know. Resist A, resist B. Yeah. 
right? And now you can say here um, that person, person equals D. <laughs> person in US, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, we got it. All right. So anyway, the point is that now we have more flexibility than I think that just cryptography alone has or just logic alone has, right? We can combine them in a way that they are more than the sum of the parts, okay? Because now you can hide things through the power of abstraction in mathematics, and now you use exactly the same machine to generate a proof for this. Okay? All right, right there. <laughs> so we are here. Now we have a mathematical proof, and we have the claim that we made. <coughs> Now, the question that actually we've always had for a long time with K was why should I trust K? Right, so K is such a big monster, 500,000 lines of code, four different languages. I don't think there's any one person on the planet who knows what's going on in K, completely. <laughs> I certainly don't, and I don't think anybody knows all the, all the pieces. If there is anything certain for sure about K, is that it has bugs, I guarantee that. You don't even smile anymore. <laughs> well, it goes to, to case, Mike. <laughs> it goes to do case. That's sad, right? <laughs> right. So it has bugs, right? So then the question is, why should I trust what K does? Well, now, because we force K to spit out the proof, mark the proof. And now we can check it. Okay, so that implementation in MetaMath has 199 lines of code. So 199 lines of MetaMath, we can check any proof about any claim in any programming language, okay? So we reduce the problem of trust to 200 lines of code, okay? But it doesn't solve our problem and this is huge, okay? But it's also a very important problem that we had for a long time. Why should I trust Ken? What is that? Sound. Soundness of? I, I don't know how, in cryptography probably I would call it sound, right? Yeah, soundness. We also call it soundness. But the problem is that if you once you generate a proof object, right? See the proof system is sound, you know that it is semantically true. But the problem is that K, even now, can give you can prove wrong things for you. Right. It doesn't generate proof objects for them. <laughs> because it cannot. Uh, but the the thing is that once you generate proof objects, now you can check for that soundness, you can verify the soundness. And that's exactly what this does. It verifies the soundness. It doesn't verify the completeness. It doesn't verify the semantic validity because semantic validity is not tractable. Right? Something may hold semantically, but you cannot prove it with the proof system because the logic is incomplete because it must be incomplete if it is expressive enough. Right? So the logic is incomplete. There are truths that cannot be proved. Like the other incompleteness here, right? Comes with a bunch of problems about natural numbers that cannot be proved. We can define natural numbers. So we certainly cannot prove lots of things by design. Um, but if you prove something, I can verify it with these 200 lines of code. You now I know it's for sure it's correct. I don't have to trust K anymore. K is chat GPT. K gives me search for a proof for me. Right? I tell it what I want, and K gives it to me. Right? And you say, I think it's true. <laughs> okay, let me check it. Let's try check it with you. Step by step checking. Step by step checking. You mentioned logic from this axiom, with yeah. this rule. I get this axiom. Right. I just yeah, very simple-minded. I follow the rules. And exactly, blindly. Blind. And I don't want to be smart at all. No, no. If you if you have one more space in this proof object that I didn't implement in my because I don't want to implement parser, but if I cannot afford to implement a parser, you know, in this <laughs> one of code, it must be perfect. I just check it. What if there is a small bug? The proof says. Oh, it will reject it. Well, no, no, I, I'm sure it's sound it's right now. Sound. But it's wrong. But can you go back and can you update the proof? Yeah, like the big of course. Proof? Yeah, but that, that's why you need tools. That's why you need nice error messages, user interfaces. That's what we want to do. But next. the checker would not help you. The no, checker is no, like, no. so the, no, it will no. not be able to. The checker to will say. Just that. Yeah. And you cannot learn where in the big proof no. something went wrong. It may it tell you that this step I couldn't, model spawners doesn't work. Right. But you would still have to do a lot of things by. Yeah. But that, that, that's what you want. You really want to spend a lot of effort here to generate that proof object and to have good tools around so that once you are done and happy with it, push a button, 
don't have a beer, and then Ijan is the full function. Exactly, there are so many things that can go wrong. I don't want to formally verify K because it lets an impossible task. It's not even clear what it means to be correct. I cannot even define correctness. In I just wanted to say it could go a few rounds of iterations until we get a proof that is accepted by yes, the checker. Exactly. But that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. That you know that it's you actually proved. You may be you may be aggressive. You may implement all kinds of crazy optimizations here that uh, are correct in principle, <laughs> right? But sometimes they go wrong. Like chat GPT has hallucinations, you know, once in a while. But uh, when it works, I verify it, done. Good. I know it's true. But you see, this separation of concern is actually the essence of pi squared, but I think it's super important, right? Because we use the best of mathematics to get a mathematical proof. And now we move to the next stage, which is if you can verify a mathematical proof, you can verify everything. No, no, 99% of mathematical proofs are wrong. The proofs mathematicians do, Leo is not here. Yes. The proofs they do are wrong most of the time. Or they seem like magic and you actually don't. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And when we check the corner cases, they forget yes. something, you know. There, there, are, there was a study, parentheses. No, I don't think so. They're not constructive. We have negation, they use it in all kinds of dirty ways. Right. But um, there, are, there, are, there are studies, right, uh, where they looked at top journal, I think journal of the something, mathematical sciences something. And it turned out that more than 90% of the main results in these papers were wrong. They tried to find a little corner case, you know, in which the, the which was not accounted for in the, in the theorem. Of course, the author said, yeah, yeah, but the idea is right. Yes, of course. The result is it's wrong. Eventually, at some point, yes. But anyway. Get back here. These are very rigorous mathematical proofs, machine checkable, right? Mathematical proofs. And for that, you really want a very small and simple uh, logic. I don't think it's really accurate to say that the proof checker has 200 lines of code, especially now since our new checker is like 2,000 lines of code in Rust for the binary form. No, I'm sorry. I, I said the, in the MetaMath. Even in MetaMath, you still have to trust MetaMath. So the trust base is a bit bigger than the 200 lines of code. Well, but then you can go to silicon electrons and so on and stop somewhere, right? So typically, people, when they talk about the proof checker of OCaml, for example, they say it's, I don't know, it's 30,000 lines of OCaml. Yeah, well, that's relative. Of course. Okay. It's relative to, for instance, x86. It's no, no, but nobody counts how big it is in x86. They say it's 30,000 lines of OCaml or 10,000 lines of OCaml. And now you have to also take your OCaml compiler into account and all that. So we usually stop at the one programming and we implement in a language to say that's how big it is. Yes, you can eventually. And then we won't share it. Um, it depends, like, depends uh, how you prove it, prove checker. Like, mm -hmm. You prove it in itself. And that it doesn't really help you because you end up yeah, no, no. Yes, you have to prove it in some even more basic. Then the question is, is right? the, yeah, you have to trust the proof checker, can you, and you can have multiple. So here's another thing: you can have multiple implementations of proof checker. Right? In lots of that's actually the philosophy of MetaMath. Right? They have twenty plus implementations in different programming languages. The Rust implementation is, I don't know, 500, 600, 700 lines of code. C++, 2,000, right, right? And now what you can do, you can run all of these implementations on the same proof object. Okay. Yeah. Right. Or, um, but anyway, you cannot get better than that. There is no other smaller trust base for any expressive logic out there. Possibly, but I, I just feel like it's a bit misleading. Like you can always think of a higher level language where you can maybe write it in two, like 
not. Yeah. No, no, but you have to still express the proof system, right? So Fox proof system has 50 plus reports. And they are implementing 30,000 methods per account. If you ask people what the trust base of Fox, they'll say, well, 55, whatever, proof rules. Yeah, but how about interpretation? They say 30,000 methods per account. That's where they stop. How big is the camel? How about the compiler for camel? They think it is one. Yeah, I'm not saying that other people do it better, like specifying how big the trust base is. It's just that it's a bit, it's a bit annoying how there's no, yeah, there's no standard for. Oh, but what is a line? I mean, you can put the whole program on a line. Yeah. So what? What the proof checker? But first of all, that's the wrong problem to focus on this thing. It's an excellent year seven <laughs> problem to worry about, right? So right now, there are so many things to do before we get to this point, okay? So it's hard to imagine, actually, we don't know by any metric, any other smaller proof checker. I want to see one. If anybody comes to say, hey, this is smaller by this metric, it's fine, I'm considering. So take the logic. The logic has only 12 proof rules. I can write them down now. I can write them down now, right? One and a half days after five years. <laughs> can you write the lean proof system? I asked Adam Chipala, can you write the cock proof system? Do you, know, do you know at least how many proof rules there are in cock? It's between 50 and 60, but they keep adding proof rules. Good <laughs> day. Other guys. Okay. So you see, there's a big difference. Because they don't care at this level of detail. That we care about here because executions now become this is like hardware now we have the same concerns that the hardware guys have when they verify their um, hardware all right so visiting or not it's very small okay you can write it down i'm sure it's like <laughs> The compared to major three, like if there are assumptions in cryptography, so you try for years to 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 basically test it, test rules that that you found, uh, and you compare to everything else that exists, and where people think that they are still very happy, but you are happy with that. Right, at this point, yeah, it's like a, it's an assumption that you actually test it specifically and works very well. The others are not looking to improve this assumption in there, like they do, they do, they but. Uh, you know, it's not clear actually how to handle any model to run for them, right? Because we know if we look if we look at our uh, you know proof rules, I mean if you look at the starting with the syntax, right? Every single construct fulfills a big, huge role that uh, nobody, no, no others can fill. And similarly, if you look at the proof rules, the proof rules each of them has a very Clear objective distinct from the other two rules, right? So I, I'm not saying that we cannot eliminate maybe some proof rules. I suspect one at least that uh, could be provable. But uh, all the others are uh, pretty minimal. I mean, they're minimal. Mm -hmm. What do we need to What do we need to implement? So we have, so we have people working on this. There is a team now of I don't know six, seven, eight people. Hmm? At Advi, yeah, working on this part, led by Shaw Hong. Yeah. Right. And here we have to first focus on just execution. The LLVM backend. I mean, these people also work on this part with the help of the LLVM backend. We want to first do verifiable computing for all the names. Yeah. yeah. And the challenge here is how to print them and consume them at the same time. Okay. So the whole thing is piped because if you, if you want to store the proof, then you are there already. That the proof thing is quite like huge. We have some examples already. Okay. One, two, three, three. I haven't seen it. That's what I'm asking. So we have several. Um, we had several rounds 
several waves of, of prototypes here, right? We have a prototype where we generate these proofs, we store them, okay. and then this guy reads them, right? We have a binary format now. Uh, I don't know how far we are with that. Um, but the problem is that this is these proofs are huge, so you're going to store them and read them. You know, they take a lot of time, right? So now what we do. We try to get as close as possible to the tooling case, right? So when the tooling case generates the log, the proof uh, hints, those are immediately streamed the proof checker, which then immediately streams them to the to the CK circuit, right? So uh, this proof object will never be even stored because it's so big. You are checking in parallel already. It's yeah. not Pipe. parallel. So pipeline. It's a, a kind of one line check. Yeah, exactly. And our objective, so the objective of these guys here is to generate the ZKP in real time. If this is generated, you never need to buffer anything. Just keep generating. And the way they do it, they take each proof step of matching logic. Let me show the matching logic somewhere. Let's put in a different one. Just a second. So by the way, this is the syntax, okay, of matching logic. Okay, so if you look at each of these constructs, right, it fulfills a unique and super important scope, right? This abstraction, these fixed points, this logic, just one construct for logic, reasoning, implication. You need something, be it and or negation, you need something. You just have one implication. And so on, right? Each of these fulfills a clear goal. And then if we go to the proof system, okay, here's the proof system. Now, if you look at each of the proof rules, right, these 12 proof rules, right, each of them has a very clear objective. Right, so the Lukasiewicz, this is the only axiom or proof rule that we need for propositional, for logic, propositional calculus. Okay, the only axiom, and now modus ponens, this is classic in almost all logic, right? Modus ponens is necessary. And now the rest of the proof rules, right, are again, each of them. So I suspect that this one and this one may be provable, maybe, if you prove the bottom. Right, so he looks skeptical, but he spent a lot of time to deduce the proof system. I think he eliminated one of the proof rules. He had uh, 15 at some point, and now we have only 12. <laughs> okay. um, so we be, I believe personally that these two you know, can also be hopefully eliminated. But then all the others are pretty pretty standard. So this, this allows you to do local reasoning in a context. Then uh, this um, is the fixed point of mu, the fixed point property of mu. This is the least, makes it the least fixed point. So we have only two proof rules related to, to inductive reasoning. Anyway, so. Let singleton variable should be broken up into multiple. The singleton variable is very ugly. This is very annoying. I agree. I agree. But we have to move on. You know, we cannot just wait forever on the polish the proof system. But anyway, so the proof system hasn't we we're happy with the proof system for quite a while now. So now let's make this fast. You see, some proof rules have uh, premises, like like modus ponens. There's two premises. I like have to prove this and this, and then you can prove this. But most of the others, there are five proof rules like that. One. Two, three, four, five. They have premises, but all the others are like axioms. They are they are standalone, right? So if you have a circuit for it, I can check it, and I don't need to depend on anything. I don't need to keep track of anything. Okay. Actually, I have only one circuit, and then as the proof is generated, we dispatch the proof check to the right circuit, and then each of them will generate then a zk proof. That I apply this proof rule. And then we have to merge all these proof, uh, um, all these 
cryptographic or arguments, all these arguments for each of the steps, right? Into one big argument for the whole proof, right? Some sort of Merkle tree commitment scheme, whatever. We keep that open for now. But we'll find a way to combine all these all these uh, um, proofs. What do I want to show you? I mean, this is ultimate recursion because I have all the steps and I can check each step completely independently of all the others. And here is the interesting thing, another interesting thing. There is no state that I have to carry, like you have in smart or other. Right? I have to carry the state, even if part of the recursion, you have a state here, a state here. And that can be big. Right? In our case, there is no state, actually, because the mathematical proof, you build incrementally the whole theorem in the end. There is no state to carry from one step to another. It's like the atoms that you put together and they also build the state by the nature of the proof itself. So that's why I think there are so many good things going on uh, that something amazing will happen here, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So you say there is no state, but. Right. So you would have basically. You can have an independent verifier for each small proof, and that verifier take the proof and some public input. And when you move to when you batch these proofs together, you have to batch the public input as well. Isn't that the state? This is the public input, indeed. So this and, and have, you have to carry this with you. So I mean, you this on the blockchain. Actually, this is on the blockchain, the, the programming language semantic, and this is the transaction which says that all these transfer one to both. Okay, and you make this. Theorem, an abstract one, right? So I say there exists a state, you know, of Alice, which has the value V. And now if I transfer one, Alice will have V minus one, and Bob will have V plus one. Okay? Or even even if I make it concrete, I say, you know, Alice has a hundred, and now Alice has 99 at the end, I make a very concrete transaction. Okay, then yeah, that is the state. But everything in between, all those steps in between. Okay. When I generate the zk proof, I don't need to send those states right to the to the states. Uh, are you talking about the state that you need for the Yeah, exactly. The public input has to be aggregated. So the public yeah. input grows with the number of. Um, no, no, no. So, so each each step will touch only one little thing in the memory. Look at this proof rule. Yeah. Okay. This says that if you Infer something, you can now apply it in any context. Okay, so I may have in the state, the state can be big, right? Okay. But in that state, I think that I modify. Oh, yeah, sure. That's Alice. Part, sure. Alice, okay, from, um, you know, let's say 10 to 9, right? I only have to provide this little delta information and a bit of context so that I care about Alice, and this becomes a variable. For this particular proof rule, I yeah, don't, I don't to, care. To of this course, state. I don't care about everything else, but still, this small part of the big state, this this is part of that particular proof step. So each yeah. proof step would have to mention whatever you need from the from the context, but it will mention it in a way like this, that will become a little sub pattern of a huge pattern, but the huge pattern is abstracted away. I don't have to mention it. Yeah, I don't care about the, the big part, but I still care about the small part. And that yeah. counts as input. You cannot have the proof without the input. So the, that, that is part of this formula that I prove. And that is, I don't know, you could mention something as if we really just care about the cryptographic proof, but they have sent only if you also mention somewhere the I part can, I can comment on that. Yeah. yeah. So I think one of the question is, when you try to merge certificates for two steps, Aren't you forced to describe the two steps that the certificate is for? And if you describe those two steps, aren't those too large? So this is how this looks. Okay. So there is an S. Okay. And in that S, I have Alice okay, equal 10. And this implies, this is the mathematical imply, right? Imply next, the next step. Okay. I'm going to have Alice equal 9. Okay. So this is the formula phi that I prove. It is so the delta in the state change is now part of the formula. 
but not performed at the time, the time true. What I'm saying is that I don't have to describe the entire state of the I don't know, ERC20 contract. I don't care about this. I care exactly. about the small part. That small part has to be there with the it, proof as well. It's in the formula. It's in the theorem. That's part of the theorem. But it has to be somewhere else for the... I don't care about the theory part. Yeah. I really care, care about the crypto part. You have to carry yeah. that as well with pi. No, no. So this, all these pi, the steps, to so take them the corner. I don't even care about pi. I really care about, like, even on Ethereum, uh, when you want to prove, like, recursion on Ethereum, you start with state on Ethereum, state A, you do transitions, you don't, transitions are part of what happens, you know, uh, it's actually hidden by the succinctness, and you end up with another state on Ethereum. And you have a proof that there are that conditions. That's the transformation. Yeah, there, is a, so there is a proof. Yeah. Uh, and the proof can be verified if you give the initial state of Ethereum and the final state of Ethereum. And that state can be written as two commitments. Yeah. So that stays. All yeah. that part stays. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't That's what change. I mean. You cannot. No, no, but, but, but if the program, for example, has you know a million steps yeah. to take you from that state of Ethereum to the other state of Ethereum, these a million steps. They themselves transport little things in the state, in the local state. You know, I don't care answer. about that, but I want to say that the initial and the final, uh, if you have another proof for another transition from model, so you have state one to state two, and you have a proof, yeah. pi, and uh, let's say pi one, two, and then you have state three and four, pi three, four, uh, you have to batch pi one, two, pi two, uh, three, four, and uh, and the uh, uh, state one, stage two, uh, stage three, stage four, this carry over, like mm -hmm. your your batch proof carry over, like in some batch way, but your inputs also have to like a linearly increase because you right. cannot. Uh, so okay. everything, everything at the interface with the blockchain, for now, let's consider it stays the same, nothing changes. But now when I execute the program, for example, like what risk zero does, for example, right? or ZKEVM, Right, so ZKVN is like a VM implementation of the circuit. And what that does, there are two parts. Of course, there's the blockchain part that does what you described. And now there is the VM specific part where you start with the original state, that of the contract. Now you execute the EVM bytecode and you get another state of that contract. Okay, so this part here is what we replace with our approach. Okay, the other part, how we incorporate this trans transaction in the big you know, uh, blockchain. For now, let's consider that state the same. Okay, we'll have we'll also be able we'll have to actually combine this because now you can write, you know, these transactions in multiple programming languages. We'll have to agree on how they change the big state of the blockchain. That's okay, but let's keep that separate. Let's just worry about these transitions within a smart contract from one, okay, state in the smart contract to the next. Oh, I. Like I, I think I understand her concern because it's something we're looking and into. So, so, so yeah, so her concern is like if you have, we'll have very many certificates of individual steps, right? And each of them will describe. So the claim will be. You mean steps in the proof of one yeah, thing? So each claim will be a single file, right? I really care about this and yeah. Right, but these are part right. of this thing. This yeah. is what you execute with the program in the smart contract. But the point is, we're not going to merge all of these. It's going to be a huge conjunction. And her question is, how are we succinctly describing this huge conjunction, which is the claim of the final certificate? Yes, definitely. No, but that will be that will be. Uh, so all, all these little steps, also, all these little steps, right? They will be also uses of proof rules, derived proof rules like transitivity. Of of, uh, of, uh, of the writing, okay, and in the end, all these proof steps will be in the same proof. They will be flattened out in the big proof file, okay, and then the the fact that all of these are true are guaranteed by this merging of all the proof steps. Yes. Okay? But I don't have to carry. That's what I'm saying. I don't have to carry. Okay, all these are completely independent, and I don't have to carry the state. Okay, from one proof step to the next. Okay, yeah. because of this kind of abstraction, I only mentioned my delta at each step, and then now there's another step that says that from this state to the next state, I do the right change and I get the other ID steps prime for the next proof rule. Right, so all that will be done by inference, and those will be inference steps in this big uh, proof object that will be merged. 
And then it's this merging that will guarantee that all the steps uh, happen. In other words, you can think of this. You can think you split the big state change from the beginning to the end in very small pieces and that you will have to mention in one proof step or another, some of the proof. So all of those will be mentioned, right? But I do not have to reconstruct the state at any given moment in the middle. Thank you. 